the series called How the Election Could Affect Planning and Investing. And normally every year about this time, we would have a nice event somewhere at a nice hotel like the Four Seasons, bring in some guest speakers and do a, a presentation, cocktail party, that type of a thing. But if with, of course with COVID, in the last time we did something like that, we had about, I don't know, 250 people or something. So uh, knowing that we can't do that that way this year, uh, we decided to do this uh, lecture series. And why we chose this as a topic is, is really because you chose it as a topic. Uh, we, we've had um, many, many client meetings over the past five or six months. In fact, um, I think over 150 meetings in the past this, uh, six months as what Bond is telling me. And, and we will get a sense of what you're thinking about by the questions you asked us. And so one of the questions that is being asked, and rightfully so, is what our opinion is around uh, the election and what the potential, you know, how the economy, markets, uh, taxes, everything that relates to your financial planning would be affected by one out outcome versus the other. So we hand picked three speakers um, to talk to us in their respective uh, areas of specialty. And, and we have this saying I've said, you know, you've heard me say for a long time. And by the way, literally every person that's on the call right now I've known for a long time um, and our clients and friends for a long time. So I appreciate you coming again to this, this, this meeting. Hopefully it'll be useful to you. But the thing that I will say is be careful who you listen to. And, and, you know, when you, when you are listening to people, you have to use judgment as to what they're saying, how they're saying, and why they're saying it, and, and whether it's a, a credible um, source or has a bias or just doesn't know what they're talking about. So uh, anyway, uh, our first speaker is John Towsley from the Venerable Goldman Sachs. The next speaker will be Leslie Geller, Geller from the Capital Group, better known as American Funds. And then our last speaker will be Nanette Jacobson from uh, Wellington Funds, Wellington Group out of Boston. And all these firms uh, are responsible for literally trillions of dollars of uh, investment management. And so with that responsibility comes some of the finest thinking in our, in our investment world. So, um, John comes to us uh, having, been, having been with Goldman uh, for 17 or 18 years. Uh, he is um, in, the, in the business for 27 years and uh, is going to give us, I mean, the top of, the, of his um, uh, topic of his talk today. Tell me again what we came up with, Chad. Uh, market expectations in the political landscape. Yeah. So um, we've previewed his presentation. We think it's excellent. Uh, and I think that's mostly what I wanted to say up front. Oh, I guess just a couple things. One, um, just on the company itself, our, the company that works for you, Brown and Company, uh, we're doing well. We've uh, been working remote since mid-March, which really isn't my nature. I'm more of an old school, go to the office kind of person. And so this kind of going remote kind of work is not, didn't, didn't come naturally to me. But I have to say that it's working very well and our technology is top notch. Uh, the team that's working for you, Justin, Danielle, Vonda, Chad, Brian, me, uh, Crystal and Aaron, uh, have uh, all been working for me for a long time. We all know each other very well. And so it, it has, uh, you know, surprisingly gone well. Their firm is growing, uh, we're, we're bringing on new business, uh, but really what we've been doing is focusing on you, our clients. Uh, and, and so we've been outreaching in many different ways, uh, having meetings. And, and another thing that we, we are, feel good about is that about a year ago, we did the recession prep scorecard 
that you may recall, basically saying we hadn't had a recession in a long time. Let's just make sure we understand where we stand with you on that. And if we need to make any adjustments to prepare for a recession, that we do so. And of course, we didn't, we didn't predict a worldwide pandemic and, and we didn't predict a recession of this magnitude. But in any event, our clients were well positioned for it and have been able to be opportunistic around that. The second thing that we did was we decided if we were to have a downturn that we wanted to tilt our portfolios. We believe that in the stock market there would be winners and losers in those companies. And instead of just owning um, all stocks like in an index, we decided to tilt it to just the biggest companies, US companies that had the strongest balance sheets, the best brands, that we knew that we believe that could weather a downturn. So with, with that tilt, um, we've essentially um, outpaced the S&P 500 on the equity side by two. And um, you, you know, when looking at your statements, you I'm sure will think, you know, how could we be in the middle of this worldwide re pandemic and recession and at the same time have a, a up stock market and an up account? So um, we can talk about that if anybody wants to get specific, you've heard me talk about that, but we are in the middle of this big recession, a big pandemic, an upcoming election, social unrest. And <clears throat> so now, now where, where do we go from here? Um, I guess the last thing I'll tell you is that after being in downtown Denver for 32 years, uh, we've decided to make a move our lease was coming up and um, I'm happy to say that we're moving to a, a brand new office in Cherry Creek at 2nd and Fillmore. And it's gonna be, a, I think, a very good experience for our, our clients and our team members. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chad. Thanks, Mark. Um, just one logistical thing to note, if you have any questions along the way at the end of this segment after uh, we have our initial conversation with John, we'll open it up for your questions and the, the lines won't be open. So the way you do that is just click on the Q and A icon in the, um, in the control panel there for this, this Zoom meeting. And you can type in questions at any time. You don't have to wait until the end and we'll get those along the way and do our best to uh, ask those questions at the end. Um, all right, so John, as we get started, I, I think it's good to start with a conversation about a big picture perspective on the markets, and then we can get into the political landscape and, and some of the possible implications there that we should be thinking about when we get closer to the election. So just at a high level, what would you say are the biggest themes or considerations affecting the market right now yeah thank thank you chad and mark and to those who have dialed in today um and we'll get straight to the point on these topics um i think as you talk about the election you have to to your point chad you have to keep the election in perspective as to other things that are driving the market and so i'll give you five factors themes risks whatever however you want to de detail them and I'm going to give you an order of importance to the market and what we think the market is trading on. And that's a very important backdrop as we talk about the election and how to, how to digest the election. But first and foremost is COVID-19, the coronavirus. Uh, this is a global pandemic. Every day we get up, we look at the global numbers in terms of transmission, infection, deaths. We look at the U.S. Uh, economy and we look at the fact that we're now um, approaching 8 million or, or approaching two, 225,000 in terms of death, deaths. We've got hot spots throughout the world. Europe right now is going through their, um, I'll call it their Memorial Day. And what I mean by that is in the United States, we started to get containment of COVID. And then we had Memorial Day, let our, let our guard down a little bit. And we had to deal with kind of the super spreading events over the summer. Uh, it looks like Europe is going through that right now because their Memorial Day is the month of August. Um, and so let's make no mistake, the dominant risk is the virus, our ability to contain, control, um, 
the, you know, the economy with that as well as the health considerations. The second issue is related, and that is a vaccine. There are two ways that you can get to herd immunity. You can let the virus work its course through the globe. That'll be a long, painful process um, and really stress the medical services, or we can develop a vaccine. Um, we believe in the market is priced for an 80% probability that a vaccine will be FDA approved before year end. There's currently nine drugs, vaccines that are in uh, phase three clinical trials. Four of them are in final review. And so the probability that, that one, two, or multiple of those gets through and approved by the end of the year, very, very high. Now, the logistics of disseminating um, and distributing the vaccine, that's a whole other story. Most of these vaccines not only um, will require, I think the estimates are 8, 000, the equivalent of 8,747s to get uh, distributed throughout the world, but they also need to be kept very, very cold. Um, these, these vaccines are uh, looking to be uh, negative 80 degrees Celsius. And so we're near a vaccine, we're pricing a vaccine, but it will take the better part of 2021 to get it globally distributed. Um, but ultimately, the market is expecting that you will see uh, herd immunity via the vaccine in advanced economies uh, by the midpoint of next year. If that is not the case and that gets delayed, if that goal line gets pushed back, that will be something the markets will trade on aggressively. Uh, the third uh, risk factor uh, would be the stimulus. Now we've seen today, yesterday, day before, the role of stimulus in the economy. And you know, if you think real in real simple terms, if the economy is you know, a bucket and the recession is a hole in that bucket draining out growth resources, we have been overfilling this bucket with liquidity, monetary policy, fiscal policy. We are factually, literally replacing more GDP with policy than we've actually lost. And so, you know, this is very important to the market. It loves the liquidity. It recognizes we're not, we're not through all the problems, but when you put this much financial medicine on the problem, uh, you create wealth probably before you create jobs. And so the market will continue to trade very sensitively to the evolution of policy. Uh, the fourth, fourth issue, again related, is the reopening of the economy. Just to put things in perspective, if in February we were 100% open, by the end of March we were only 37% open. We shuttered the economy, we voluntarily closed it as a procedure to try and contain the virus. Today, when we look at all the inputs to the economy, we're about 71% open. So we've doubled where we were in the spring, but we've still got 29, 30% to go before we're back to kind of uh, you know, operating on all cylinders as an economy. And so the market each and every day is looking for evidence of easing restrictions, uh, less jobless claims, um, more, lower unemployment, higher economic data. This is, Mark is very sensitive to the fact that it wants to see a, you know, us move towards full opening. And then the last risk factor is the election. And I put it last because that's where it belongs. Now, if we had a list of 10, it would probably be still at five. But I think you have to look at the impact of the election, and we can talk about this down the road, and keep it in context with other risks that are also dominating the tone of the market. The election matters. Uh, policy matters, uh, but the market is, is basically in a position to digest the election, we believe, fairly well. Uh, but that, again, uh, Chad, would be the, the main things that I think we have to be, the, the lens we have to look at. Uh, the virus, the vaccine, the reopening of the economy, the impact of stimulus and the size of stimulus, as well as the actual elections coming up. That's good. I, I think that sets the stage for us. Um, so it if we reflect back on what was, I mean, an immensely tumultuous year and, and then look forward from here, knowing what the market's done in recent years, what, what kind of expectations should we have going forward in terms of, of market returns? Well, I, listen, I think we need to be realistic. Um, the backdrop is attractive. The consumer's in relatively good shape. Banking system is healthy. This is a recession without any asset bubbles that have popped. And so the traditional DNA of a recovery um, or a tr the traditional problems in a recession don't exist. This is a medical problem 
not a financial or cyclical problem. So once we find a vaccine, we actually have a very healthy foundation to recover on. That being said, as everyone is aware, we are near full valuation. Um, nothing is particularly inexpensive by any historical analysis. And so when we think about forward returns, we want to be realistic. And so I'd show you, we show you this chart here on the right. The last 10 years, the market equities have returned about 13 and percent. Over the next 10 years, this is what this bell-shaped curve is showing. And when we look at the inputs for forecasting returns, they are, we arrive at an estimate of about a 6% annualized return for stocks over the next 10 years. Now, I'm an economist by training. And as you know, if you put five economists in a room, you get 10 opinions. Well, here are my other two opinions on this matter. If we're wrong and the market is better than we expect, I have a little dashed line on the right that shows we think the market could generate as high as 11%. If I'm wrong and the market underperforms our expectations, perhaps it's as low as an annualized 2%. All right, I recognize these numbers are a little bit underwhelming versus where we've been, but look at, it again, look at them again in context. I have, if you look at the left side of the chart, an 87% chance of beating inflation at 6%. I have a 90% chance of beating bonds at 6%, and I have a 92% chance of being positive and beating zero. And so one of the things I would strongly argue is that while we are talking about lower returns because of high valuation, lower earnings, lower GDP over the next 10 years, you don't have to seismically change your portfolio. At the end of the day, what you were doing in the last 10 years is probably pretty similar to what you're gonna be doing uh, in, the, in the next 10 years, same allocation, same approach towards your long-term goals, maybe a little bit more concentrated, maybe a li little bit more global, but at the end of the day, um, you know, your portfolios are gonna work hard for you, but it's gonna, it's gonna be moderate, a little more moderate returns than what we've seen in the last 10 years would be our expectation. Okay. So <clears throat> what are, you know, I, I think a natural follow-up to that is, uh, are there ways where you think we can beat 6%? Are there pockets of the market that maybe we could see outperforming um, as we look forward from here? Yeah, Chad, it's an interesting point. Um, this is a really interesting recovery. And the reason it's interesting is normally the sectors and the companies that get beat up on the way down, get have received the best recovery because they were oversold. And so the market's not efficient, it gets nervous, and so it punishes um, you know, airlines, it punishes uh, tourist areas and, and things that are really sensitive and they need high density attendance like theme parks. Um, those are the things that on the way down get really punished, but they should recover the best. Not so in 2020. What has happened is that the companies that did the best on the way down have done the best on the way out too. There is a massive acceleration of innovation, disruption, and change that is happening right around us. Things that we thought were going to take five and 10 years to evolve, COVID has made it happen. It makes it as accelerated to it might happen this year or next year. So this is a long way of me saying the way you beat 6% is you own the companies and the innovators that are going to get a little, that we think are going to get stronger. The stronger are getting stronger, the weaker are getting weaker. And so that's why I said on the last comments that your portfolios probably get a little more concentrated. The reality is, is the, the opportunity set is, is being filtered where you have a handful of companies that are true gorillas in their industry and then everybody else. And I think that as investors, we need to be thinking forward and paying attention to the companies that are going to be the dominant franchises going forward. Um, I, I mean, look at the U.S. market right now. The, the best, the top five performing companies are now 25% of our index. I don't think that's always going to, be, going to be that way. But what you want to do is position yourself for who are the next leaders over the next decade. And it's going to be in green tech, ESG, alternatives, anything that is remotely distributed 
like education and payments and commerce. I mean, we are literally seeing the world reinvented right around us. And you want to own those pockets rather than own things totally broadly and own the entire stock market. You want to get really specific. And that's how you're going to beat 6% in our view. Well, that, that strongly resonates um, with us. Mark alluded to this earlier, but we've been favoring companies for the last couple of years, uh, ones that are high quality companies, larger, um, many of them tech oriented or pharmaceutical types of companies, strong balance sheets, access to capital and staying power. Uh, the types of companies that no matter how long it takes to develop a vaccine and distribute it um, they, and totally reopen the economy, regardless of, of the time frame there, these are the kinds of firms that, that we believe can sustain and even thrive in the midst of it, which, as you said, that's not really the historical precedent where you have small cap uh, types of companies that generally lead the recovery. I think this is a different type of environment. And um, we've certainly uh, seen that play out and, and have been, um, been pretty happy in terms of the overweight and the performance of large growth thus far. Sounds like you see some of that trend continuing. Um, so let's, let's go um, in this direction, just in terms of volatility, what is different in today's market as compared to historical averages? I mean, in some ways it feels like everything's different this year, but as you look at it from a, a quantitative standpoint, how does 2020 compare to the markets historically in terms of volatility in particular? Well, um, so yes, absolutely, Chad. I agree with your assessment. And then when we think about volatility, um, wow, we've seen it all this year. And the one thing I want to talk about is when you think about volatility, there's levels of vol, and then there's speed of vol. And what I think has been most extraordinary about a year like 2020 is the speed of vol. Do me a favor and hop back one page. And I know a lot of your callers are probably not um, wanting a bunch of charts at them. The, the chart on the left is volatility as we talk about, the level of vol. And you can see the spike on the far right. But as a general rule, volatility has been below that dashed line. We've actually in the last 10, 15 years had an absence of volatility relative to long-term averages. If you look at the chart on the right, what I'm showing you is the second derivative, we call it VVIX, or it's the speed of vol. And the trend, while not super obvious, is showing that the rate of change of volatility is higher than the level of volatility. All right, so that, let's translate that. Let's go back to the, the other page, 19. So the way to think about it is when the market moves, how quickly does it move? And what we have seen is that we saw a 34% correction this year in 23 day trading days, unprecedented. We've actually seen more than a 50% recovery in a, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, uh, in a couple of months, also unprecedented. So the speed of the decline and the recovery, both unprecedented. So if you look at this table, here's some interesting things. What I show you is in a, in a, typical calendar year, and there's about 250 trading days in a calendar year, how many times, how many of those 250 trading days will the market move 1% or more? So you can see the average we show is the market moves at least 1% 61 times a year. That's almost, you know, one out of four. So once a week, you should see a 1% day in the market. You get 17 2% days, seven three percent days and you can see the, see the data you'll get two big five percent moves a year that's that's pretty normal so let's go to the second from the bottom category the average for a bear market which is what we've been in not surprisingly you get a few more days of volatility you get about 32 percent days you get 13 three percent days and six, four percent days. So you can see that. Now let's go to 2020 where we've highlighted in orange. The one percent moves, pretty normal, you know, pretty much in line with what a typical bear market would deliver you. The two percent moves, not, you know, a little bit higher, but, but not very far off. 
And then let's look at the three, fours, and fives. Versus a bear market, you are seeing single days with huge moves in them. By the way, that knife cuts in both directions. On the 13th, uh, or excuse me, uh, yeah, on the 13th of, uh, I gotta get these dates right. Um, on the 24th of March, we had a 12% correction. On the, six, uh, the 26th of March, right after that, we had a 9% recovery. On the 12th of March, we lost 10%. On the, on the 13th of March, the next day, we made 9%. So not only am I saying that these, these are not just all down days, these are up days on top of the down days. And so one of the things as an investor you have to realize is that while over time volatility is smooth and kind of washes out, we are incredibly susceptible today because the markets are globalized, information travels at light speed, disinformation travels faster than good information. In fact, we all know uh, from all the social media sites that we consume disinformation five times more uh, uh, amount and quickly than we do real good information. And so there's a lot of noise in the system. And so at the end of the day, I think one of the major things we have to think about as investors is how do we digest and, and invest in a world where volatility is probably not higher but episodic volatility is. And we're gonna get these quick shots and you're gonna look at the CNBC on an afternoon and be like, we're down 700 points, what's going on there? Um, there's almost always a, a reasonable explanation for it, but just understand that these markets um, are uh, certainly, I'm gonna call it spiky for last, lack of a better word. Um, you can get really aggressive, fast, sharp moves today that we didn't see necessarily in the past. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I mean, I'd like to spend more time there, but for the sake of time, we'll switch gears a little bit. So uh, we're now less than a month away from the election. Uh, so what are the kinds of things that you're looking at when you, you know, you're trying to read the tea leaves on potential outcomes? What are some things that, that you see uh, happening right now. Yeah. So respectfully, Chad, I don't even try. Um, I am, I am almost as an economist and as a strategist, I'm almost indifferent to elections and I'll explain that down the road as to why that's the case. I'm not suggesting elections don't matter, but I, I'm, I'm really, uh, about the facts. And I think there's just a lot of noise as we move up to these elections. So let's just think about this. I'll give you one of the classic things. The national poll says this, the national poll says that, the national poll says that. Presidents aren't elected on national polls. They're elected on an electoral path. And that electoral path is this map right here. And so it's a race to 270 votes, each determined by states. And as you're all aware, there are states that are predominantly blue that tilt to the Democratic Party, and those are there are states that are red. If you look at the composition of the map right now, the best information suggests that Joe Biden will start with about 233 electoral votes, pretty much baked before the election, and President Trump will start with 162. The states that are in play are the yellow states. We are all familiar with them. We've also included Maine and Nebraska simply because they do not, it's not winner take all, um, they're a proportional allocation. And so there's a real likelihood that President Trump could win of the five electoral votes in Nebraska, he could win four of them and Joe Biden could win one. And given the fact that President Trump needs to almost clean sweep all of these yellow states, he can get elected if he doesn't win Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, but he has to win everything else, or excuse me, Pennsylvania and Michigan, but he has to win everything else, including those, those uh, congressional districts in Nebraska. If he can win uh, all of the electoral votes in Nebraska and Wisconsin and Arizona, he gets to 270. If he does not win any of these major yellow states, it's over. Vice President Biden's path to, re to uh, election is much wider than President Trump. And so if we look at the next slide and how are things shaping up in that regard, 
I think we're all familiar with these polls. And on the right side, you can see the six states that are the battleground states. And, and Vice President um, Biden is leading in the polls. Uh, the Republican Party it will say, uh, you know, these, these polls aren't that accurate. They were wrong in 2019. The Democratic side will say, well, we think we fixed them for the education and some of the errors in the state polls. And, and there's a lot of arguing as to how helpful these are going to be. And at the end of the day, uh, the Republican Party in 2016 outperformed these polls by about five to six percentage points. And so if the polls are fixed, the Democratic Party has a comfortable lead if they're accurate. If they are suffering from the same problems that they had in 2016, the Republican Party has a very good shot at all of these states. The answer, Chad, is I don't know what the, what the truth is until it happens. What I can tell you is it's going to, it's still probably going to be very close. Um, let me talk about a couple other areas and then we can kind of start packing the narrative together. If I go one slide further and we think about the House, in the interest of time, it would be historically extraordinary for the Republicans to flip the House of Representatives. Currently, Democrats have a 16 seat or a 19 seat advantage. They have 16 seats that are vulnerable. Republicans have 12 seats that are vulnerable. For all intents and purposes, the House of Representatives is going to look pretty much like what it does right now. No major change. I would imagine somewhere between an 18 to 20 seat lead for the Democrats. Again, we got to see the data, but that's what everything's pointing. All the action is on the next slide. It's all about the Senate. And the Senate is going to be complex, not only in 2020, but also in 2022. Because this year, the de Democrats have about 12 seats up for reelection and the Republicans have 23, so they're defending many more seats. In 2022, it's the exact same backdrop. Democrats only have about 12 seats up and Republicans are defending about 22. So this is, this is going to be a tough couple years in terms of a Republican defense. They need to get to 2024 where the, the Senate elections are gonna tilt in their direction. Now, if we look at the composition of the Senate, we're all familiar, Republicans have a 53 seat majority. Um, and if we look at the seats that are in play, if, if you're on the far right to the bottom, the blue seats would be seats held by Democrats. We think Alabama is pretty much a done deal. Uh, for Republicans, they'll win that seat. Um, but on the on the flip side, if you look on the left side where they lean Democratic, um, Arizona and Colorado probably go uh, and flip to the Republican, uh, the Democratic Party. Um, Mark Kelly, very competitive, obviously, um, versus McSally and, and everybody, you probably likely know what's going on in Colorado. Those are very tight races. So if we swap Alabama, Arizona, and Colorado, Republicans are at 52, and they have those middle, those middle ground seats, and there's a total of eight seats there that are up for grabs. And so it is going to be, I, and we believe because policy often lives or dies in the Senate, it is the order of magnitude and gains that the Democratic Party can make in the, in the Senate that probably is the most important to the market in terms of legislative heft and reality. If they only go to 50-51, you know, maybe, maybe uh, the moderate Democrats become very par powerful because they're the marginal vote. If Democrats do a clean sweep and it's a, not a blue wave, but a blue tsunami, then, then they get to 55, um, that might be enough to be a bit of a game changer. Yeah, and and I think it is important to get to this level of detail because it's not just at the presidential level. A lot of what the market's going to look at is the overall composition of control. And and you know, in general, historically, the market likes divided government uh, because there's less chance for change, uh, less uncertainty. What is the scenario that has the most inherent risk for investors if? if there is one that, that you could point to? Well, I think if we go, yeah, if we go to slide 26 here, if you'll bear with me, let's do civics 101 for a second. And just like, how does, how, how does policy get enacted? And there's basically three major avenues. Uh, on the right side, we have executive order. And that is where President Obama 
and President Trump have largely navigated. This is a special uh, authority that the president has uh, to address regulation, the uh, implementation of policy, the following of policy and enforcement of policy, uh, special, pol special abilities with trade, some, some uh, powers on immigration, and, he, and the president doesn't need Congress. And so again, the last two presidents have lived in the land of executive order because they haven't had any Congresses to work with that they could get anything done. Sometimes if the president and the Senate are in the same part, well, if you get unified government, you can get a few things done via reconciliation. And reconciliation is a budgetary strategy. Uh, you can do it three times a year, one for deficits, one for revenue, and one for uh, spending. So you can't solve all problems via reconciliation because you have a limited number of at-bats. But if you, if you go that direction and it's deficit neutral, you could, you could put something big like a public option on. You could do a carbon tax. You could do student loan forgiveness. So there's clearly substantial policy, including President Trump's tax plan, that, that was done via reconciliation. Now, the left side of the chart is the big stuff. These are the things that are promised on the campaign trail. We're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. And as citizens, we're always like, why does none of that ever get done? Well, the reason is, is major legislation like universal healthcare, Green New Deal, antitrust reform, statehood for Puerto Rico and Washington DC, all of these big ticket items that find themselves on, on, the, on the far right and the far left, need 60 votes in the Senate. That's how you get past the filibuster. And you know, no party has had 60 seats in the Senate since 1977. And the only way that, the reason that Obamacare was moved through to legislation was because the Democrats had 58 seats, but there were two independents, Bernie Sanders and Joe Lieberman, who caucused with the Democratic Party. That got him to 60 votes. And that's how Obamacare got done. But apart from Obamacare, no party's had the ability to get past the filibuster. Well, there is risk, Chad, and we've talked about this. I don't, I don't expect it necessarily, but you know, there the Republicans are stoking the fire potentially of if, if they push through the, the Supreme Court nominee, that's gonna give the Democrats the justification that if they unify government, maybe they remove the filibuster. Maybe they don't remove it for everything, but maybe they selectively remove it. Uh, there's a lot of things they could do. And all of a sudden, some of these major policies, if you remove the filibuster, could be achieved with 51 votes. So this is just something to be on your radar. It's not necessarily expected. It's called the nuclear option because it is mutually assured destruction. Everything you do now can be undone by, the, uh, undone by the other party. But it's just important to understand that the reason that there's so much talk about the filibuster right now is because there, there's a strong progressive push and that may be the only way that they could actually achieve it. And uh, historically it would say low chance of that happening. Uh, in this, in a year like 2020, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're tempted to do it. And presumably, you know, we, we don't see the market showing many signs of worry at this point. So it, it would seem that um, there's the thought at the market level that there's less of a chance of losing that moderating effect ultimately and, and, and pricing in less drastic changes at, at this point. Yeah, listen, I think that's right, but I also, um, no disrespect to the market that I love, but the market can get really myopic and short-term focused. And what the market is basically saying right now is we're dictating, we being the market, we are dictating the next president's playbook. Because whoever comes into office in January, or if it's still President Trump, the first two things they do are going to be pretty much the same. They'll be different in style and size, but you're going to get massive fiscal stimulus and substantial infrastructure spending. Nobody is going to raise taxes in 2021 to slow down an economic recovery. That's a 2022 event. And so the market is basically looking at the results in November and saying, I get clarity, I get fiscal stimulus, I get infrastructure, 
and I get a, I worry about taxes probably 12 to 18 months from now. And so I think that's part of the tone on the market. I'm not suggesting policy doesn't matter and there may not be pain um, for, certain, for certain activities in, in Washington, taxes, um, some, uh, you know, things like that, but it's not gonna be in 2021. And so I, I think it's very important to realize that because the election is happening in the, mid, in the early stages of recovery, either candidate's pretty much doing the same thing the first year of their administration or the fifth year of their administration. They don't have a lot of flexibility here. The market's telling them what they have to do. Yeah. So let's say we, we get a scenario where we have a, the market has a big sell-off um, on or subsequent to the election. Do you recommend looking at that defensively or opportunistically? Opportunistically, all the way. Let me tell you a few things I believe. I believe in the strength of U.S. institutions. And even if we get a contested election, there is a process in place, an independent court process in place to address contested elections. You have a month to get ballots certified. The real deadline is December 8th. That's when states have to submit their electoral votes. And so we have a little more than a month after the election to get it all ironed out. And then after that, if there's disputes, it goes to court. And if there's a tie, there's a process for a tie. There's a process for dispute. And so no one wants to see the sausage making in a contested election. But I believe in the strength of the institutions that come inauguration, the country will agree on who the next president is. And we will move forward with policy. Um, I also believe in the dynamic and uh, creative and innovative power in the U.S. economy. And I'll give you a, a, a simple example, and, and please bear with me for a very uh, pop culture reference. Uh, this week was my personal, I'm done, I'm done with 2020. The, the straw that broke the camel's back happened for me this week. And it was the fact that I'm 53 years old and my Beatles on Ed Sullivan moment was a guy named Eddie Van Halen. And uh, he is, we all know, is, is often considered to be the, one of the, if not the best guitarist ever. And when you, when you, I was reading an interview of his and he talked about growing up and he immigrated to the U.S. and they were, they were poor. They didn't have two nickels to rub together in Southern California. And so as he was learning to play guitar, he didn't have any money to buy, buy effects and pedals and all these things that guitarists have to make their sounds really, really neat. So all, he had to figure out how to do it all on his own. And so he developed techniques to get sounds and harmonics and tones out of guitar that no one had ever done before. And it was out of sheer desperation and constraints. And so out of that was born innovation where Mozart and a mad scientist collided into a guitarist. And I say this because I believe the same theory works for the US economy. The reality is we might get a suboptimal mix of policies. We might have some constraints, but cycle after cycle, innovators, we learn, we navigate, we adapt, and ultimately the market continues to move higher. I cannot show you an election where the market sustainably melted down. It's not in the data. In every election we go into, we fear the market meltdown. Where's the data? Where's the proof? It's not there. We respond to change with innovation and creativity, which leads me to this chart here, Chad, and I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. But this chart is really powerful if you take it in pieces. And I just want to focus on the last piece in the interest of time for all your people who've dialed in. You can see in the middle section, we call the post-election divergence. If the market, the red line is up three months before, the election that's historically good for the incumbents. The incumbents have won 23 out of uh, 20 out of 23 times. The dark blue line is if the market trades lower over the three months before the election, incumbents have tended to lose. The market has basically said uh, things are not looking good for the party in power. All right, doesn't matter. Here's what matters. Look at the last section. The market responds in a really similar way regardless of who wins. 
when the market finally gets clarity, it's had about a 3% rally into the end of the year. So this chart is measuring it from early, uh, early November. The reality is maybe it takes us a few weeks to get finalized results, but the market upon clarity will rally because of the power of the institutions and the power of the US corporate economy, innovation and creativity. I totally believe that. And if I had data to the contrary, I would show it to you. I don't have that data. So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, if you get sell-offs, if you get volatility in October and November because of election uncertainty, we are buyers, we are not sellers of that. Great. I appreciate that Van Halen uh, analogy too. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of time. We did have two questions that came in and maybe we'll, even if, if we have to um, answer them briefly, the first is, and, and this ties into actually something you were saying earlier where the market loves all this liquidity. Um, and, and we know that's true in the short term, but this, this client asked, uh, what do you think about the increasing national debt and how will that affect our economy in the future? So 20 seconds, go. Oh, 20 seconds. <laughs> kidding. We're on an unsustainable trajectory. But if you think about most companies, most countries, when they default or go bankrupt, it's not because they can't pay their bills. It's because they can't refinance their bills. The whole trick to the U.S. deficit is our access to glo the global market. 80% of reserves, assets, and liabilities around the world are held in dollars. We are the reserve currency. And so even if the problem for global economies is generated in the US, people wanna protect themselves in dollars. So as long as the dollar is the reserve currency and the treasury remains tier one risk capital, we're gonna be able to refinance our deficits in the foreseeable future. That's not to suggest we're not gonna have a problem. It just means that problem, for the last 40 years, we've just been refinancing it and push kicking that can down the road. You probably have about 15 more years before demographics and healthcare just overwhelm our economy and it slows down our GDP and our debt becomes a true financial burden. So if the math just is what it is, get, we've got 15 to 20 years before just the, the math is a problem. The other issue, and this is what I'm not creative enough to understand or know, is that timeline could be accelerated if there was the development of a currency or some alternative to a dollar. I don't know what that could be. It's not the euro, it's not the renminbi, but at some point, if there are a lot of countries, Russia and China in particular, that have zero interest in transacting in dollars, and they feel like the, it drives them crazy that they support our currency through international trade. And so if there's ever the development of a credible alternative to a dollar, that's going to really accelerate things uh, for us. Uh, but as I think as a general rule, the deficit is something that we watch, but it's not a clear and present danger. Great. Um, just one more. So we have a question about municipal bonds and what should we think, how should we think about the municipal bond market and what potential impact could the election have on munis? Um, just some maybe initial broad thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I think this is a sector that probably is um, a little more sensitive than others. There's, you know, energy, healthcare, financials are also sensitive to elections because they're at the leading tip of policymakers often. Municipals, particularly if we have an infrastructure bill, um, could really benefit in terms of the, the, the investment in their communities from a federal level and the jobs that that would create. But depending on how they financed it, you could see an offsetting mechanism if it was financed purely in the municipal market, maybe through they resurrect Build America bonds. And so you could get a massive supply of bonds. And so thematically investing in our communities is great for municipal bonds. It just depends how we fund it. And there could be a short term hiccup in munis if we get just a, a ton of supply to support some of these projects. Now, we, I say that because I grew up in the role of munis and I, we, we are risk averse and, 
and nobody likes losing any money in munis. But let me tell you, this is a cottage industry. The other things that are going to help munis and offset what I just said, higher taxes, phenomenal for munis. Investing in healthcare, phenomenal for munis because that improves their payments and their receipts because so many hospitals are supported by the municipal market. Uh, we've talked about the infrastructure and the jobs that come from it. So I'd argue that, you know, while there's a technical risk for how they fund infrastructure, a lot of the democratic plans on the margin are better for the municipal market. Uh, and by the way, nobody is talking about removing the tax exemption for munis. Of all the sources of revenue that are out there that people talk about, you know, reducing muni uh, uh, tax exemption is not in that dialogue. So we feel really good. Uh, uh, about the municipal market would continue to, like to me, that's the dry gunpowder. We've talked a lot about stocks and the opportunity, but no portfolio makes sense without some pretty good ballast. And I can't think of any better ballast than munis right now, even after the election. Thanks, John. Uh, this has been really, really insightful. Um, so we're almost, yeah, we're getting close to an hour. Um, so I think we'll, We'll wrap up. I, I will say that anyone that has any questions, please um, send those to us via email, reach out. Uh, but also, Mark, I don't know if you want to say a few words to you know, close us out here or if there's anything else we, we want to mention. Oh, you're on mute. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So uh, thank you, John. I thought that was a very... Uh, well uh, presented uh, talk. Uh, some of these things are not easy to um, present, and I'm a, I'm a, always looking for good presenters. So I thought that was uh, really uh, well said, and I appreciate your balanced approach to what you had to say. And I think probably one of my uh, great, one of my biggest takeaways of what you did say, because I totally believe it as well, is that regardless of uh, what's happening in American politics, uh, the underlying capitalism, uh, free enterprise, uh, the creativity of uh, the American business person uh, really will, will, will win in the end. And, uh, and so that, that makes me worry less, even though it's nerve wracking, uh, it makes me worry less about you know, the next five and 10 years versus the next you know, five or 10 months. So I do appreciate your time. I appreciate you talking to our clients. Uh, I appreciate to, our, our clients and attending this meeting, Chad, for moderating. And um, we look forward to talking to you all soon. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.